Hello there. I'm really excited about the topic today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, persistent data structures, immutability, and the implementation uh, that we have in Clojure. And I also highly recommend not to skip this video if you're not interested in Clojure, uh, but you like a JavaScript developer or any other language, because the idea of persistent data structures uh, is really cool. And uh, hopefully it will give you a bit of uh, motivation to learn that and maybe search for libraries that do the same approach in your language, or maybe it will give you some motivation to start your closure journey. So um, one of the key features of closure as language is that uh, the they have some strong base ideas. And one of them is that all data structures that we have in the language are immutable by default. And let's take a look what that means first. So let's say we have a map right here, right? Uh, we define a map M and then we have A and one. So after that, we have access to map uh, M. Uh, what if we want to add a new key into the map? We can do, um, a SOC uh, M and then B2. So we have a new map right here as the result of this function. But the thing is that the original map is still there and nobody changed that. So here we have immutability. So by calling the function that adds a new key in the map, we're actually not updating the existing uh, collection. We creating a new one and then add value there and return it. So after that, what we can do is like, let's say we want to define M1, for example, and it will be a result of a SOC um, M, B, and 2. So now we have two references. We have one, uh, we have M, and we have M1. And this is really cool uh, because immutability by default uh, solves multiple problems. So first of all, uh, in multi-threading concurrency environments, we just eliminate a bunch of problems. Uh, so if you have immutable data structure, you don't have a problem that uh, multiple threads can uh, change it because even a single thread cannot change it, right? Um, and uh, so th that's not enough uh, to build a, a concurrent applications because you need a way to synchronize the state between um, threads, but there is a thing called Atom, uh, which I already covered in one of the previous videos about concurrency. Uh, but it's it's still like immutability just reduce a huge uh, set of problems that would happen in concurrent environments. Uh, but the other thing that uh, I really like and that could happen even in single threaded environment is a situation when, uh, let's say you have an array, something like that, and then you call a function that takes this array. And this function is for, from some third-party library or some code that you, uh, some other developer created. So you don't really know what this function is doing, right? It could return something, but it could return nothing, etc. And the thing is that after you call it, um, you can end up in a situation where this array was updated in place. And actually there was quite like, there are quite a lot of examples like that. So, um, I'm not exactly sure about the syntax, but something like you call a sort function on array in multiple languages and it will sort this array in place. Uh, or something like you have an array class and a static method and you pass your array inside and instead of returning the array uh, back, asserted one, you, you have an updated version of array, like updated array in place that you passed. In Clojure, you won't get that at all. So, for example, if we have a sort function for like one, uh, seven, two, three, uh, we call it, we, re we have a new collection back, which is sorted, but the original one um, wasn't touched. So, for me, it is like a game changer uh, because I can just pass my collection uh, or my object in any function and I know that I can still access exact same version after the call in my code without the change. And if I want this object to be changed, uh, it actually a, a new copy that will be returned to me. And uh, this is really cool enclosure because it's like on a global level in the language. So it's really hard to write a program that's working like with in-place update or almost impossible, which is really cool. 
The question that a lot of people um, have at this point is this feels like a waste of uh, memory, resources, etc. Because the first approach that you think about in this case, it is something like uh, copy on write or copy on update. And it works something like you have an array one, two, three. Uh, you want to add a new value. You copy everything to a new array and then add a new value. So you basically duplicated this data and you have to do uh, that all the time when you create a new version of your array. And obviously this approach won't work at all. If you want to go with this way, um, you'll have a huge memory usage and a lot of resources will be used uh, to copy this, to create these copies when you need them. Uh, but there are a solution for that, and it is called uh, persistent data structures. It's not th something that was invented by uh, Closure or Rich Hickey. Uh, there's like, they, there was like a paper about persistent data structures. It was just implemented in Closure for, for the needs of the language. And the, let's take a look into some high-level uh, understanding how those structures work but they're basically solving this problem of a uh, uh, huge overhead with this approach with uh, copy on write. And the key of that is that all structures, uh, no matter what we're trying to implement, map, set, uh, vector, or list, uh, all of those will be a tree uh, under the hood. And um, I'll try to demonstrate how that works. Uh, of course, it will not be a detailed uh, explanation, but there are multiple resources available uh, in, on YouTube, for example, that goes into much more details about the bitmaps, etc., how that, that works. Um, I think this uh, tree that we're using inside uh, in Clojure implementation it has lo like a branching of 32. Um, uh, now I just have like a reduced version of that. Let's say we have uh, any data structure, as I said, under the hood it's a tree, and we have just a root, and by uh, having the link to the root, we have access to the entire version of this data structure. And let's say we have a node uh, that uh, contains value A. It is somewhere in the tree. And then uh, we want to replace this node with something else. So the thing that the algorithm will do under the hood, it will just copy this node, um, just single node, and then let's say we want to keep the entire, uh, the, the rest of the uh, structure is the same. So the thing we want to do is we want to link this to um, to the child because we uh, change this node. And then we have, um, then we want to copy the root. And let's call it uh, one for the new root. And we link this root to our new node and to unchanged nodes from the previous tree. So now when we have the link to this new root, we'll have access to a new uh, version of the persistent data structure. And it's called like persistent because it's a data structure that after changes will have you will have access to all the versions that we that you have um, that you created before. And as you can see, uh, because we using uh, we reusing parts of the structure, which is like a structural sharing, uh, it is memory efficient. And also, as we uh, had to copy only uh, bits of the original tree, it is efficient to create the new version of of the data structure. So, good thing is that I understand it's quite hard to understand, and I don't understand all the details and implementations. But the thing is that to use that. Um, you don't have to know how that's implemented. You just need to know that her characteristics of uh, data structures like map, array, etc. are staying the same and uh, they are memory efficient uh, and you have immutability by default. So that's why I really like uh, the closure approach uh, when you have everything immutable by default. It makes your applications uh, so easy to understand and reason about that I just like fall in love with that uh, since I started uh, writing closure. And to finish, um, 
to finish the video, uh, I just want to go quickly through available data structures in Clojure and provide some examples how you um, work with them, some functions on top. And first one is list. Uh, this is the interface that it implements. So the list is a bit weird because uh, you cannot just do this because as we're using Lisp, uh, all lists are trying to be evaluated. So the first argument uh, will be looked at as a function by the compiler and uh, it will try to execute one on top of these args, which we don't want. But with this quoting thing, you can... Um, overcome that and we, we now have a list here. Uh, the other a bit more verbose uh, way of creating a list is to call a function called list and this will result in a list. So um, under the hood it's just like a linked list uh, if you know that data structure. So we have a node and then we have a reference to the next element and also I think it uh, um, calculates the count. So uh, if you want to get count of a list it will be a big O of one uh, complexity and a uh, couple functions so first of all you can check that uh, the data structure that you pass is a list by calling this predicate list so if we put a array that will take a look in a second it will be false but if we switch this to our list it will be true and then uh, you can use list to emulate um, a stack uh, and you can call this peak and pop functions so let's name this as uh, def l1 uh, and validate that so then we can do peak uh, l1 it will be uh, one uh, the head and then the pop will be the rest uh, rest of the the list so we're just removing removing the head and returning the rest there are other functions like first and, and rest. Um, it's just like if you're implementing stack, those two are more idiomatic uh, names. Then, yeah, and also list is not uh, commonly used. Uh, uh, usually, if you want an array or something, you just default to a vector, uh, which uh, you can think about as an array list, uh, like a dynamic array in Java. Um, so the special syntax is to use these uh, square brackets. It will create an, a vector for you. And then you have also the vector function to do that. But nobody usually writes this until you want to create your vector programmatically from, from, uh, from the code. So a couple function that you can use is like uh, you can use uh, get and uh, let's name this thing actually so def v0 and then we can use this one to uh, get an element so it's zero based uh, indexed array so index zero will return the first element i think if you uh, go out of scope you'll get nil and also you can put a default if you want as the last argument so if if it's out of bound, it will be defaulted to whatever you put here. So something like minus one, um, minus one as a default, let's say. Then we have nth, uh, which is similar. Like we uh, we can do uh, same zero. Uh, it will be one, ten. Um, and actually this one will return an index out of bound exception, which is a bit annoying, but you can uh, provide a default in this case, and I think it will work here. Yeah, so with default it works, without default it returns, uh, throws an exception, but the get uh, returns nil. So a bit annoying, but yeah. Um, also you have peak, which is same, right, as, as we've seen before. Uh, but in case of vector, um, it is from the uh, tail, like the, the last index. And yeah, a couple things to um, change elements. So I think a sock uh, will replace an element by um, ID, uh, by the index. So let's let's check uh, key and val. Uh, so key here will be let's say zero, and uh, let's put minus one here, 
and you can see the result is we replace the first element uh, and also you get these same things like first of v0 the first element there's also second v0 second element you don't have third but you now can switch to nth and do v0 uh, 2 which will be a third element and also things like uh, rest v0 to get uh, the rest of ray and then drop but last etc so it's a bunch of uh, function that works on all collections uh, next we have probably the most uh, commonly used uh, data structure is a map you can also think about it as a, like an object in javascript so literally it's just a hash map on the hood the syntax is uh, this you have a key value pairs uh, you can uh, just use white space uh, like a white space between uh, but some people prefer to use comma to separate uh, pairs if you write them in a single line and also you can put any number of uh, spaces closure um, uh, evaluator just ignores all the spaces so this is the map um, there's also a sorted map but it's not commonly used as far as i uh, know from from my experience and uh, there's also a way to create hash map without this uh, curly braces syntax so you can just go use this hash map function and uh, here you just pass uh, um, key value pairs so whatever you want like it will be a map of one to one two and two um, and same for sorted map and then for sorted map you can pass a function uh, to compare keys and it will be sorted by by keys so to update to work with a uh, closure maps you have a uh, sock uh, which is associate so it will be something like let's uh, name this thing uh, def m um, m0 so a sock to m0 and kd4 uh, will return a new map that will have these values then we have uh, the sock uh, the opposite so m0 and we want to desoc a i think it also supports multiple keys um yeah key and keys and you can just pass uh, other key if you want that works and actually for a sock uh, it works the same way if you want to sock multiple things you can do uh do it like this so next thing select keys uh and we want now to pass a vector of keys that we want so if we want just one key it will be in this but also as you see it just shrinks the map so it's still a map as the result but uh, you have only keys that you're interested in so let's say we want these two it works like this um what else uh, and merge merge uh, will merge two maps so let's say we want merge m0 and let's say we want to add something uh, this will be emerged and also if we uh, have the same key here it will be an overwrite for the most left map in the merge uh, let's say 10 and here in a we'll see 10 and also it works with multiple maps so let's say we want c uh, minus 10 so you see it, it works uh, merge with, works with multiple maps um, then we have get uh, m0 a uh, will return 1 0 x will return nil there are no value but you can always provide a default here it could be anything just keyword or string um, just default and then um, contains contains will tell you if there is a key like that contains a will be true uh, contains x will be false and that's actually a difference uh, because uh, let's say we have a map uh, like x nil so this will return true but if we do get um, get x nil x 
So in this case, uh, th this is a subtle difference here. If you want to check the presence of the key, you really want to use contains because if you use get and you return nil here, you, you don't know uh, is it nil the value of that key or if it's not found there because the result of this when there is no key will be the exact same nil. Um, it's a bit of confusion I've seen in some developers that starting with closure why we have two functions like this but that's the case if you want to check uh, if key is there. Uh, yeah, and then we have uh, so all all of those uh, data structures are actually collections. So you can iterate over them, called something like map, reduce, and you go element by element. In, co in case of map, if you do iterator over the map, it will be a sequence of uh, map entries. Uh, and the map entry is a vector that contains a key and the value. So let's call first on um, M0. It will return this pair, the first one. Uh, actually, we lucky that it will be returned this one because in general, maps are unsorted. So there is no guarantee uh, that your key, uh, like they will be the same order. Uh, so first it will re return the vector, but actually it's a um, key, uh, key map entry. And we can call things like uh, key on top of that, which will return the first element a or value, um, and it will return one. Or uh, as an alternative, you can do the structuring here. So this will be a map entry, right? And if we just print it, we have this. But if you know how the structuring works, you can just put an array here and you can destructure first element to key and second one to value. Uh, that could be any names you want. And then we have a key right here. It will be A or value, which will be one. And finally, we have uh, sets. Uh, so special syntax, like a literal uh, support for is this. Um, similar to map, but you add this hash uh, in front uh, this returns to uh, like the returns a hash set which is like a set of unique elements and if you want to convert some uh, vector to a set uh, with duplicates you can call a function set and it will shrink it to a distinct um, distinct elements I think there is also like a distinct uh, function but in this case you see we don't have a setback we have a uh, list uh, or sequence uh, with distinct elements which is slightly different so yeah and uh, to update set like let's say you want to remove uh, you you want to call this this join and then uh, I think the same like contains function uh, works if you want to check if there is like a specific key so this is false and this is true and also worth mentioning that um, that all of those um, collections implement the function interface, so you can actually call them. And this is leading some confusion in developers sometimes. So let's say uh, let's say you want to get uh, to to get an element here or check that element contains here. So you can actually call S1 because it's like a data structure, but also it implements a function interface. So you can call it and the argument could be an uh, element. So this will return A, but if you call it with something that's not uh, there, it will be nil. Uh, so for set, it works like this. For map, if you call it with A, you will get a value of A. And also, it is uh, supporting the default as well. So m0 of x is nil, but if you put something like this, it will be defaulted. Uh, so yeah, this is like a valid approach. And for vectors, uh, same idea. It will be a lookup by index, like this. Cool. And final thing is uh, transient collections. Uh, 
um, I literally working with Clojure for like seven or eight years. I never written a transient function in my life. Uh, but good to know that you have an option to fall back and save a bit of uh, performance if you uh, if you do that change to the or building data structure uh, locally to your function so nobody has access to this uh, collection at that point it's perfectly fine to mark your collection as transient which will make it uh, immu immutable and then you can use a specific set of functions uh, to mutate uh, that uh, collection in efficient way and after that when you're ready to return it you just call persistent and it will convert it back to immutable data structure and this is fine because it's local to the function so um, it doesn't break any guarantees that we have and this is kind of like example from this uh, link about transients and we have like a vrange function and vrange2 and it just creates a loop and then we have a vector here and we go from 0 to n and we just build an array that contains the value um, and we always increment this i so result will be like array of 0 to n minus 1 and here we have the same logic uh, but here instead of immutable vector that we start from we uh, starting with a transient vector and the difference here that we're calling this conj with uh, exclamation mark uh, which is specific function that will only work on the transient collection and at the end when we're ready to return it we were just returning v here but here we do persistent which converts our transient collection to a persistent persistent one and these are numbers that are from the from the link that I shared. It was using Java uh, 8 and Clojure 1.7, so pretty old. And also, I believe, uh, it was different laptops at that point. So I am on uh, M2 MacBook Pro, uh, and I just run a simple benchmark test for both of those versions and it took a while but uh, this, those are results so uh, the mean time execution for the uh, immutable one is 15 milliseconds and for the uh, tra transient one is 12 milliseconds so if you compare the difference here it's not that significant in my um, in my test but still slightly slightly faster um, so yeah uh, I think that's all. Um, hope you enjoyed the video and you have a bit of motivation to learn more about persistent data structures. And also, if you're a JavaScript developer, there is a cool library called Immutable GS, and uh, it was kind of inspired by Clojure, I believe. I heard people complain that it's quite slow, but I cannot prove or uh, uh, do the opposite uh, because I don't have any ben benchmarks but the api is pretty nice and you don't have to care about these mutations uh, and you also you have on top of that you have the access to uh, things like map reduce and group by etc a lot of function that you expect from uh, closure core but in javascript um, cool that's all for the video uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and also you can always support my work on buy me a coffee uh, have a nice day uh, see you next video bye bye